So I used to do heavy lifting uh, in high school <clears throat> and at the gym. And my youth pastor also got into weightlifting a lot. He was he went from I think one one fifty, one sixty, maybe six foot to like two hundred forty something ripped sickening. It was it was like awesome. So he got me into working out. Along with a few other characters. Uh, and I was playing baseball, riding a BMX bike, doing rollerblades, skateboards, playing basketball, soccer, golf, uh, wanted to play football, got into playing football. So I started doing heavy lifting. My specialty was squats, box squats, leg press, and uh, deadlift. One day I think I had broken up with a girl. So I went to the gym to blow off some steam. I was real mad. So I think she had cheated on me. Uh, so I got as many weights as I thought that I could possibly do in my adrenaline pumped angered state got the box and two spotters and proceeded to box squat 1,005 pounds no, 1,015 pounds. And we were using, you know, of course, Olympic-style bars. Bent the bar. <laughs> Had to take it to the shop class. Have them heat it up and bend it back. I was pretty stoked. That was pretty awesome. I think the most I ever squatted was uh, 825 or 875. Leg press I could do, you know, over 900. Uh, sitting down. Deadlift was 525 or 475, somewhere in there. I had... Uh, your trapezius muscles right here that go from your neck to your shoulders. If you remember the WCW wrestler, Bill Goldberg, he had huge neck muscles. I wanted to emulate that, so I started doing all these neck workouts and stuff and shrugs and deadlift shrugs. Then I had the biggest trapezius muscles in the school. But we were having a deadlift contest one day. And one of the guys on the football, on the varsity football team, was going against me. He was like 6'7", six, 6'8". Six, uh, so he had a lot, a lot further way to go. It wasn't really a fair competition. But he ended up uh, deadlifting right around like 4'15", but his hand slipped. And he dropped the weight on his pinky toe and blew his pinky toe out. I know I shouldn't be laughing. He's all right, though. He can hang nine. Uh, but we had uh, we had two brothers in school, Jason and Jesse. Jesse was older than Jason by a couple years. They both worked out like three times a day. And they were just sickly ripped. Yeah. Bringing it back. So, they, uh, 
they would always include me in these stupid contests of who could do the most crunches and who could do the most push-ups or sit-ups or something stupid. And we got going and just overdid it. And I think two of us ended up puking. We did play a prank on the principal once. He drove a, a S10 short box. He was also the football coach. About six of us linemen went out in the school parking lot during lunch. Picked the back end of his S10 up and spun it around in the parking spot. You see what kind of stupid stuff you do when you're pressured by people to always be perfect? I didn't think there was a moral to any of these foolish stories, did you? You used to have a couple of Mustangs in high school. Yeah, 89 and a 91. One day I went out to the parking lot and I saw that somebody had hocked a giant loogie right in the middle of my hood. And the whole car was uh, bright fray, uh, flame red and the hood had a black stripe down the middle and they hocked a loogie right on it. Found out who it was. And uh, me and a buddy of mine may or may not have went squirrel hunting and put a squirrel in his heater box and I may or may not have put a dead raccoon on his muffler taught him a lesson don't mess with me Stupid high school things. Uh, but Pipe Pastor, what you were saying. Uh, preacher's kids who have all that pressure to be this, you know, holy angel, this faultless child. There's like a spotlight on you in every direction. The community's watching you. The church is watching you. Your parents are watching you. The school is watching you. Because as soon as they know that you're a preacher's kid, you know what I'm saying? Magnifying glass comes out. They're just waiting for you to make a mistake so they can call you a hypocrite <clears throat> or a uh, or if you are good there were a few if you were good all the time then you were labor, labeled holier than thou oh are you sitting on your pedestal you think you're better than me you're holier than thou. No, not at all. Ha! This is a terrible story, but it's funny. It'll relate. Uh, sixth or seventh grade, I'm sitting in homeroom, and I have a friend by the name of Robert Bates. Hey, Robert. And we all cut up. He was called to the office. Now, homeroom wasn't an actual class. It was just kind of where you wasted 45 minutes. 
and um, Robert Bates to the office. Robert Bates to the office. I said something rather funny. I thought, and everyone else thought. But apparently, word got back to my father about what I said. He did not find it humorous at all. I said, Master Bates to the office, repeating what the intercom said. Well, the next day, we went back to school, and there was a little bit of a communication problem between my father and I. And he said, what classroom were you in? I said, I was uh, in homeroom, which uh, he didn't understand. So we went to the classroom I was in that I said what I said. But the same students were not in that classroom. And he made me stand up in front of the class with him in his suit and tie, announce who he was and what I was going to be doing. And he said, I am Pastor Wesley Duncan. And this is Brian, your classmate. <clears throat> And he has something to say. No amount of explaining could get me out of that situation. So here I am standing in front of my classmates in a totally different class. Apologizing for my crude and vulgar language. And they're all looking around like, what? What are you talking about? We, you, you've never said anything. We, we, what are you, what's going on? <clears throat> and after I apologized, he said, My son will never speak like that around you again. Have a good day. And left. Leaving me to answer about 50 questions. And to this day, everyone that I graduated with remembers that. But it was rough, man. Growing up a pastor's kid, I did drugs. I tried to make drugs that I had no clue what I was doing. I, uh, Ran around with the wrong crowd, trying to be cool, trying to get people to like me. Well, here's something that is interesting for those who don't know it or may not ever have recognized it. Or it may be you, and hopefully this helps. Some of the most foul and rotten people vulgar and crass people in this world currently are Christians are people who were Christians this Christian means Christ-like who were Christians at one point and either got bored or fell out of love with Christ and decided that they wanted to go into the quote secular world and try things out. See, there's a problem with that. Mainly because a person who has never believed in Jesus Christ and never confessed that they're making Jesus Christ the Lord of their life and that they believe that he died for their sins so that they can be redeemed 
from the curse of law, saved from hell, and all that good stuff, that uh, they, uh, where was I going? So a person who's never made that confession and never believed that in their heart, to be truth, is walking in darkness. And I don't mean that they're evil. I just mean that they haven't been. They haven't been shown the light of the world. And what I mean by that is Jesus is called the light of the world. So it says that when you do, when you do confess Christ as your Lord, you get transferred from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of light of his dear son. So you literally literally move residency. There's a change. When there's a genuine, genuine thing, there's a genuine change. So you have people that have come out of darkness into the light, either fall out of love or get bored or get misdirected and they try and go back. It doesn't happen. So then you, you've you taken a, a person who was one way, who has been reborn, and then they try and go back. Well, the world immediately will recognize a Christian. You look different. You sound different. You act different. And when that person who is a Christian is trying to go back, backwards it creates a riff and the people will know that because they'll have been watching you and listening to you and they'll be able to tell that you're trying to do something different and so then that person who is trying to go backwards will act even more vulgar and crass indecent than the people of the world to try and convince them that they're one of them. So, if that's you and you recognize that, stop running, man. Stop running, lady. Come back. You know, you know it doesn't feel right. It's like putting a right-handed glove on your left hand. No matter what you try, it's not going to feel right. And the running is just going to make you tired. Let's just stop. So that's what I was trying to do. I was trying to... Uh, get people convinced that I could hang with them. A lot of ash in this tobacco. There we go. So... I did a lot of stupid stuff trying to convince people that I was one of them. And it didn't matter. They knew better. I was trying to... I was trying to chop a tree down with a butter knife. It just wasn't happening. I just wish somebody would have told me sooner. But once I decided to stop screwing around and get serious, I decided that I wanted to be baptized. Never been baptized up to that point. Man, what a change. Complete difference. Old man died. Going down. New man rose coming up.
and what a great thing it's been since then. My pastor says in a really good way that the people of the world think that being a Christian puts you in a box and that you're so limited on what you can do that you give up your freedom when you become a Christian. And it's better to just do what you want, live the way you want, take your chance, just kind of go on, go on the way you're going on. But they bought the lie. And really, if you're not saved, born again, a Christian, whatever term you want to use, a disciple, then you're in a box. You're the one that's limited. And you're the one that's chained and bound. Have you ever tried to get free from something? Smoking cigarettes, addictive drinking, pornography, adultery, eating too much? That one hurts. Getting away from any bad habit. You can't do it. Not in and of yourself. You need outside help. And by outside help, I don't mean somebody else. I mean someone else. One person. Jesus. So. <clears throat> it's people who have realized that Christ gives them freedom and liberty. that uh, those people are free, as it says. The truth does not make you free. A lot of people quote that wrong, and a lot of people say that wrong. It isn't the truth that makes you free. There's lots of truth out there. It's knowing the truth that makes you free. So if you want to get free from something, know the truth about it. And if you don't think there's absolute truth, there is. Whether you agree with it or not, there is. You may not agree with gravity, but take a, uh, take a step off of a building and try and argue your way up. Dang I am. And uh, I'm not real sorry if this is preachy. I didn't mean to get preachy and that was not my intention this evening. But I wanted, I guess, this just kind of came up. But I'm sharing this information out of love. I don't want to see anyone miss a wonderful opportunity to know the better things in life and be able to be free from something. I don't want that sitting on my conscience. And I don't want my Lord to tell me that I missed the mark and somebody missed an opportunity because of me. So, I guess that's why I'm telling you. It's not so I can feel free from any kind of conviction. It's so that I can hopefully help someone get free from any kind of condemnation or shame or guilt. And know that there is a better way. <laughs> and he just said, try me out. He is very much a gentleman. He won't force anything on you. He said, if you seek me, you will find me. So, 
Those are good words. If you're really looking for something, find Jesus. And whatever you're looking for, you'll find it in Him. So I hope that helps some people out. So, with that, just about finished with the old LaRocca hog leg. Excuse me. My friends, deep down inside, I do love you. I have a love for you. And I wish only the best for you in everything. So enjoy yourself. Enjoy this evening. Enjoy life. A great price was paid so that we could enjoy life and not just go through it, but really have fun with it and enjoy it. And if you're not having fun with it, then you're doing something wrong. So, I will be back again, different bat time, same bat channel, with probably a different pipe, and probably a different message. Have a great evening. Really been fun talking to you, but uh, 27 minutes. If you're still here, thank you. I'll cook you dinner. Have a great night. Have a great day. Hope you have a great 2014. Viacondios.